Today on The Topping Show, Twitter names a new CEO, Adidas will sell the remaining Yeezy's inventory, WhatsApp confirmed to be spying on users, Spotify to remove songs generated by artificial intelligence, Fast and Furious 4 Nissan GTR sells for a record amount, Chris Pratt under attack for being Christian, Trump's campaign adds debut, and Peloton recalls 2 million bikes. All that and much, much more on The Topping Show. Today's episode of the Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. I have to say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me. That, that's the joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner and need a little assistance with your IT, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going into the business part of the podcast, one of the most dramatic things that happened since Elon Musk bought Twitter is him actually naming a new CEO. Granted, he's still going to retain the title as Chief Technology Officer, and his goal is to focus more on the technology behind the app, make it a little bit more more around the goals of the X app, which is his long-term vision of having an app that can do everything, which is pretty ambitious, but would be revolutionary. He's had the idea for darn near decades, and it actually was the first company he ever founded was X.com, which was a finance, financial company, which was acquired by PayPal, his famously back in the day. Now, Elon specifically named Linda Yukario as the new CEO. Her background is concerning for, to many folks. She's part of the World Economic Forum, which is an unelected cabal, some might say, trying to control the earth and all the things in your life. But she's also worked on folks on the left as well as on the right. And given her background, it's not too shocking because Elon, again, they need to make this profitable because it's been bleeding money for years. So a little bit about her background. She was the head of advertising for NBC Universal. She's the chairman of the global ad and partnerships for NBCU. And she was that for more than a decade. So she's about to start with Twitter in about six weeks. She was hired by Trump to service on the Council on Sports, Fitness and Nutrition. And then on the opposite side of the aisle, she was a member of the Ad Council and partnered with Biden's White House to create COVID vaccine campaign that featured Pope Francis. And if you look at who she follows on Twitter, there are a lot of folks in the middle as well as on the left and the right, including political commentators such as Ben Shapiro, who's the co-founder of The Daily Wire, very popular media company headquartered out of Tennessee. So she's followed both folks and there's still a lot of people concerned what is she going to do when inherently if your main goal is for advertisers you're going to have to re-implement censorship since advertisers are more often than not very middle and actually much more on the left side of the political aisle usually more often than not less controversy equals more attractive for advertising dollars so if her goal is strictly advertising and increasing how much revenue the company can bring in, she's probably going to censor some of the folks who are a little more politically opinionated. And a lot of folks are concerned because, frankly, the best thing that Elon did when he bought Twitter was to reinstate all the accounts that have been banned. More often than not, they were, of course, all on the right. And he did, he wasn't a free speech absolutist. He did not reinstate Alex Jones, which I usually, I think of Alex Jones as the litmus test for if you're truly a hardcore or true believer in free speech, because he does say some of very outlandish things. That's his personality and that's also his job. But again, he's an American citizen. He has the right for free speech. And Elon was very much vocal about him not reinstating his particular Twitter account. So Elon is by no means a free speech absolutist, but he did reinstate many people to the platform and they've readjusted their policies so you can have more conversations versus less, which I, of course, am a big fan of that since the best ideas always come to the top through open debate and philosophical discussions. So time will tell to see if she's gonna make the platform better. And a lot of people are also just saying he had to have a CEO take place because He's grinding it out 100 hours a week, and he's got trip, uh, three companies trying to juggle. I mean, he's the leader for Tesla, which is, you know, number one EV company on the planet. And there's a lot of concern from their shareholders in terms of 
the technology behind Tesla isn't as bleeding edge as it used to be in their opinion, where they used to be the industry leader and they still are by volume of units sold. But I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, some engineers, I believe they were at Nissan, it was a competitive automotive company. They purchased a Tesla and they took it apart. You know, I mean, rudimentary speaking, it's reverse engineering. You buy something, you take it apart, you examine how it was put together, what's what are the components. And at the time they were saying it was such a big leap in technology that they were 10 years behind Tesla. So there's a big gap between them and the traditional automotive community, which of course the stock, the stock market and the consumers rewarded them by purchasing the product and investing in the company. But he's also the head of SpaceX, which is the most revolutionary aerospace company in my lifetime, and especially in the private sector. It's the first truly successful independent private sector aerospace company in history. In terms of rockets, we have aerospace like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. Those aerospace companies make more traditional things such as airplanes, missiles, and those items. But to truly go to space, the closest we ever had was Beale, which was uh, Andy Beale. He's the founder of Beale Bank in Texas. He started an aerospace company, but a couple of years in, he had the same difficulty where he's competing with NASA. He didn't have as many resources as he would like, and he was having an issue where he was bleeding money for so long. And again, that's where Elon had much more capital to work with, as well as you know his team, his intellect, his drive. But it's just a thing, very resource intensive thing and a big risk. So, and then he also just bought Twitter for $44 billion and he's trying to make that profitable for the first time ever. And so he, his plate is full. He also has, he has kids. He, he has a very intense schedule and it's being divided. Now, of course, the best leaders hire people who are smarter than themselves and build teams better than themselves. That's what I like to think I do at my technology company. And even though he's hiring all those people and companies seem to be running well, the perception from the shareholders is still of concern. So let, a lot of people are speculating he had to choose someone and he's been seen with her publicly before and they've um, been on little, not, I forget what we call them, not councils, but they've been on little, it's a fancy term for when you have a couple of people sitting at a table during a conference. Of course, it escapes me at the moment, but they've had interactions in the past. and. I'm not too optimistic, just given her background, even politics aside, her background and her number one goal is advertising. And I do appreciate her perspective. She's written some, she has a focus on the metrics of advertising, which is something that's extremely difficult in some cases to actually perform the, examine the metrics to see if it's an effective advertising campaign. And Twitter does need that because you do need to measure those advertisements. I, I'm a little pessimistic in terms of, I think she'll, when push comes to shove, she's going to choose the dollars over the free speech and granted, hopefully that's where Elon will maybe balance her out, but time shall tell if this becomes a business blunder of the day. Now, other interesting business news, Adidas finally decided what they're going to do with the about billion dollars in Yeezy's inventory that they've been holding onto for about a year. Now, for those who don't know, Yeezy's was a brand collaborated with Kanye West, whose new name is... West or A, I, I can't keep track of it, but famous rapper, I guess clothing designer too. He had a mental breakdown. I don't know if it was coincidental timing, but he's going through a divorce, losing custody, uh, partial custody of his kids. But he said some disgusting anti-Semitic things and everyone dropped him in an instant. What both the banking industry, Chase kicked him out, kicked his account away and Adidas, Ironically, given the company history, they were founded by folks during World War II, but they immediately just said, we're not, we're going to freeze, we're going to cancel the partnership and we're not going to sell these shoes. So they have all this big inventory in shoes. Granted, they're not like food in terms of a perishable item that will go bad or expire, but fashion, with the exception of me, most people think fashion moves quick. This suit's years old and the shoes are even older than that. I think my shoes about 10 years old. Nevertheless, I'm one of those people where I like to buy something and use it for quite some time. Most people in the fashion, they use it, just recycle it, just disposable, some might say. I always still wear my dad's suit from when he was in, what was it, was his wedding? Or was it when he was in college? It's a nice gray suit. Nevertheless, it's one of those things where a lot of people, they just buy in a cyclical rate where they just keep buying, 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 and they might not think a shoe from last season looks good in this season. So. The head of Adidas is wondering, what do we do with the astronomical amount of inventory that we have? 
of all these shoes. So they finally came to a decision because they, if they were to sell it and profit, that might be considered and construed as anti-Semitic because of Kanye's stance. But if they do nothing, that's a lot of inventory being just sitting on the shelves or more appropriately their warehouses. And that's a cost because we can get into warehousing, inventory control, just heating, cooling, those are massive buildings. Can't exactly just have these outside. So they had to do something. So their CEO, Bjorn Gilden, he noted that they were gonna sell the shoes and donate the proceeds to charity, which in terms of the situation is probably the most prudent business decision that you could make. It, it's a good way in terms of you are fixing the issue where you're, you're gonna decrease your cost to hold the inventory, but you're also gonna do some good because it's gonna to go to charity. And also from a business perspective, you're gonna get a nice tax rate off because of that charitable donation. So given the constraints of the situation, that might have been the, I, I think that was probably the best bet that the CEO could have done. Now, other interesting business news, you have the WhatsApp app, kind of an awkward term like saying ATM machine, where the M and ATM are stands for machine. Nevertheless, WhatsApp has been found to be spying on users. Not too much of a shocker. Now, it was founded in 2009 by Brian Acton and Jan Combe, who are actually both former Yahoo employees. And they sold it to Facebook for $19.3 billion. So that's quite a good payday. And they eventually left Facebook in disgust. They actually had a campaign for leaving Facebook and they helped start Signal, which is another encryption app that many people appreciate. Now, this was brought to light thanks to Elon Musk retweeting it, where a user found that the app was activating and accessing their camera and microphone even when the app was not open, with one user actually screenshotting their history of app usage, where it seems like it recorded him nine times while he was sleeping. And a lot of, a lot of people are wondering, is this a coincidence Facebook now owns it? But have you ever had those situations where you're sitting with someone, you're talking about a product, and not 10 minutes later, you'll be on the Facebook, and you'll scroll and you'll see that exact same product. And you did not search it in terms of you didn't go on the internet and click, you know, enter it, which for some reason that just seems more palatable or more appropriate in terms of advertising and ethics. In my opinion, I know you're selling your soul when you download those bastardized apps, but it's also one of those issues where I think the form of acceptable advertising, a lot more people are comfortable with. They know if they go to Google, Google makes their money from advertisements and selling data. If you go to Google and say stuffed armadillo, you're gonna get an advertisement for, here, here's a tax to armadillo, here's a plush armadillo. And you understand that because you use their platform to search something and they sold that data to folks who manufacture that product so that they can target you with an advertising campaign. That seems a lot more, that seems straightforward, that it's logical you're getting Google for free. Well, nothing's for free, it's your data. But that seems like a very simple idea that most Americans I think could agree with. The thing I'm concerned with and more people should be concerned with is you're not, people are not clicking yes on these apps with a comprehension of the understanding that they're gonna be recorded all the time. And again, I joke, once, be, once I get, get into politics, that's not taking power, there should be a simple one page, no BS terms and conditions for everything in life. And there's a rumor, some libertarian once told me where the founding fathers thought if an average American could not comprehend it, it should not be a piece of legislation or a piece of law. Granted, thanks to a myriad of reasons, including parenting in schools, reading comprehension and history understanding is basically at all time low. Yet I'm told we need to pay more and more. But nevertheless, it is a good idea in terms of, it should be easy to, to digest and easy to comprehend when you're agreeing to a terms and service. It'll never happen, I don't think, because what are those? The average terms, terms and service is 80 to 150 pages, but to have this app just randomly listen to you, well, it's not randomly, it's selectively targeting you, and you see that just for spite, I do not purchase, I never purchase those items once they do that. Perhaps it's not spite, that's just doing what I think is right, but I don't think that's ethical. So if I ever talk to someone about a product or a service, and then I see it on the Facebook or somewhere later, I will not do that because those companies are buying that data, so they're partaking in that. So it'll be interesting to see if this actually gains some steam or people stop using it, but other interesting controversial business news, Spotify is starting to remove music generated by artificial intelligence. Now, they're doing this in part to protect the artist's community, which makes sense. 
and they're specifically removing songs created by a music IT startup called Boomy, B-O-O-M-Y. Now, Boomy utilizes AI to generate songs by letting users choose beats and style, which are then taken into account when they put into the machine and it creates a whole new song. Now, these songs are then published on Apple Music and Spotify, which generate royalties. And users usually collect about 80% of the revenue when they put their items on those platforms, to my understanding. Boom has generated over 14 million songs. And Spotify started to take that down. Although, even with Spotify now proactively trying to take them down, they've only taken down about 7% of the total uploads. And this is something that's controversy now. It'll be interesting to see in the future what's the perception from Americans and people in general. Is that really considered art or is that just a bastardized form of music? Personally, I agree with the latter. It's similar to when someone on the internet posts a video where a computer with a nice little CNC machine or it was a little robot arm and the end of it was a drill bit and it was drilling to marble. And because we have 3D scans of the best works in history, you know, Michelangelo's David, basically the most beautiful statues in history, we can scan it and then the computer can just recreate it perfectly in terms of an exact replica. That's not art. That, to me, that's not art, that's garbage. It's just a copy and paste. It's no different than me printing the Mona Lisa on my little HP printer. It's it's a copy. It's It didn't take any skill. Although perhaps copy pasting and pr clicking the print button is a little bit above some folks education level or I was going to say perhaps a little bit too advanced for some but it's not art. That's just a copy and paste. Same with that statue and same with this in my opinion. Now other interesting things going to the culture part of the podcast the Fast and Furious Nissan GTR just broke sales for a myriad of ways. So this is from the Fast and Furious franchise. This franchise has generated $6.6 .6 billion in revenue. And that's before the Fast 10 comes out in a couple of days or weeks, which is the 10th in the series. Which, in terms of how old these movies are, the very first one in the movie they had a situation where Vin Diesel is interviewing Paul Walker and they're asking Paul, like, hey, do you have a record? Have you been to jail? He's like, no, man, just, you know, overnight in Fresno. So, I mean, Vin Diesel just goes, you ever hear about this thing called the internet? And he had to explain the concept of the internet to the main character and say, oh, yeah, I did a background check like that. And they also, the main thing that they were stealing, so it's about street racing and stealing merchandise or semi-trucks full of electronics. They were stealing VCRs and the VCR TV combos. There's a tube TV, as in it was a cathode, CRT tube, cathode ray, and it had a VCR built in, so you put the VCR. And that language might be so ancient that half of you might have to leave this video and go on the internet and want, under, wonder, what is a VCR? What is a CRT TV? And now they're going to space and doing ridiculous things. But that's how long the series has been around. It has a cult following, and it did transform the automotive car community. It... Everyone wanted a Mazda RX-7 or for uh, Vin Diesel's main car in the first movie. Or, more appropriately, I mean, the, you know, Toyota Supra. But today we're talking about the Nissan GTR. Perhaps the pinnacle of Nissan engineering, some would say to this date. Now, this Nissan was a 2000 Nissan Skyline R34 GTR. And it was used in the Fast and Furious 4 movie, fourth movie in the film. The car sold for $1.357 million dollars at Bohams State's auction, which is a new record. The previous record was a Nissan GTR back in 2002, was sold for $577,500. So that makes this the most expensive Nissan sold in history, which again, is not a lot of Altima's going for a lot of dollars, not, but still it's a huge note in the culture of automotives, of cars and the movies and Paul Walker. That's 80% of the value of that car is because he drove it. Not only did he drive it, but he was involved. So the car was per first provided to Universal Studios, which is a brilliant studio behind the franchise. I say brilliant because these studios, it's like gambling in terms of production of books or media, podcasts, YouTube. Most of those things will fail fiscally in terms of they lose money, they bleed money. 
you have to find the one that's going to not only generate profit for that one piece of art, but also expand so you can reinvest in others and hopefully find enough to keep the business flow and then grow the business. And Universal Studios took the gamble and it's become the most popular racing franchise I could think of. Now, this car was originally provided to Universal Studios back in 2008 by Kaizo Industries. And interestingly enough, one of the reasons this is worth so much is the only single chassis that is not a stunt vehicle. Now, if you look at movie production, most stunt vehicles, they're stripped down in terms of they usually don't have correct odometers. They don't have the, the accessories are all visual. There's a great documentary and a great YouTube channel called by Craig Lieberman. He was the technical director behind Fast and Furious, also known as he was the car guy who actually helped them make it look authentic. And he noted how the stunt cars, a lot of them wouldn't even have the right engines. They would actually have like fake little pressure gauges where it was just printed and then slapped on. So there's a big difference between a stunt vehicle, which is just for you know making the moves happen, and the actual vehicle that is used for like the glory shots. It's similar to handguns and guns in movies. The ones that you see running around, whether it's Stormtroopers in Star Wars and John Wick, if they're running around actively and they're dropping the guns, most of those are rubber. They're just straight up, you know, put it in a machine, they squirt out the rubber, press it, maybe they put some paint on it, but they're mostly just rubber. Now, the glory gun or the main, the hero gun rather, that's the term for the main one of the movie, that's one where it might be the real one just adapted to only shoot blanks, but mechanically, aesthetically, the slide, all the components are real. And visually, you could tell, obviously, up close. Now, this is the only single chassis that was not a stunt vehicle. And more importantly, Paul Walker personally requested a myriad of mods to it. And this, I don't know, this might be hard to prove, but this bullet point, this is funny. This is probably worth, what, five two $200,000? But the fact that the seat of the car remained in the same position where Paul Walker left it at the end of production in Fast and Four. And of course, unfortunately, he did pass away. That's gotta be worth a couple hundred thousand dollars. I'm actually astonished they didn't weld it in place or it's one of those things where it does limit who can use the car, but in terms of historical provenance, he was an icon of the automotive community. Every, I mean, all around great guy in terms of everyone had positive interactions with him. Now, this car is a little tricky. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection actually seized the car early in the production of Fast, Fast Five, which is the fifth series, and due to the legal questions regarding its importation. One of the things that sucks about the United States in terms of car culture is it's prohibitively painful to import cars before they're 25 years old. Before then, you have to make a myriad of different changes to make them, quote unquote, street legal. There are very, very few exceptions. I believe one is called, there's a certain classification where it's like, if it's a very one-off a car, they could be imported as a show car because it's not something that the mass, it's not like a Honda Accord, it's not gonna be mass produced. I think that's made, but it's actually just more of a piece of artwork. So there are some exceptions, but more often than not, you just have to wait 25 years. Now, the Skyline was brought by Kaizo in Japan, and they imported it into the U.S. without an engine as a kit car, which, again, there's different classifications. That makes it a little bit easier to import. It's not drivable at the moment, obviously, because it's an engine. And then they reassembled it over in California. So it's not too surprising. It's over a million dollars. I mean... Just the Nissan GTR alone is a magnet for enthusiasts. It's the pinnacle of JDM or Japanese domestic market. I mean, it is a marvel of engineering that I know one of my buddies at the track who takes his on track. He has a vintage R34 and they're just amazing feats of engineering. It's hard. It's impossible to be in one and not smile, I think, but a big piece of culture and It'll be interesting to see if it goes up, if it's ever re-auctioned. Now, other interesting cultural news, you have Chris Pratt being under attack because he's Christian, again. Now, Chris Pratt is a longtime Hollywood actor, and every couple of years, he's just under attack because he's a man. I mean, it's one of those things where he has a beard, he uh, actually hunts, so he actually, he likes to eat meat, and people just, the, really pisses off the vegan community. Although I would always argue the, the healthiest way to eat is to know what you're 
to kill what you eat in terms of you know exactly where that deer came from. There's, you, there's not anything artificial being put into its actual body. Or, to me, that's the cleanest way to live, and I hope to have the opportunity someday. Now, most recently, he's being a, he was the big hit in Super Mario Brothers, which that movie has grossed over a billion dollars. The most expensive, or rather the most successful video game adaptation in history, bar none. The second best, I believe, was World of Warcraft, which is about two to four hundred million. It was in that area. So it already doubled the second. So he is the really the pinnacle of Hollywood in terms of a lot of the movies he's in max out the box office. He's basically some say he's single handedly saving Hollywood as most of the movies continue to flop and lose money. But every couple of years they remember, oh yeah, this guy's Christian. We should talk shit about him. Now, one of the things that I admire about him, he was actually a door to door sales rep, which is one of the most toughest jobs in terms of, or any sales job really also, but you're gonna get nine no's or 10 no's before you get one yes. Most people don't wanna to talk to you. Um, even when I cold call and do drop offs to, to this day from an IT company, I mean, it is a numbers game and you gotta develop some thick skin and some persistence and tenacity. Thankfully he has that, so he doesn't back down from a fight, so to say. Now, he actually makes, they're like, they get really pissed off. He says, oh yeah, he likes to go to church. And he made the argument when a reporter was saying, hey, a lot of people don't like that value. He goes, well, about, a lot of people hated Jesus about 2,000 years ago. And he turned out to be, our, I, mean, I mean, he makes a good point where sometimes doing the right thing or standing for the right thing is re very rarely ever the most popular thing or popular position to take. And it'll be interesting to see if they ever back off. I don't think so because... He's the antithesis or the opposite of what Hollywood stands for in terms of he actually has values, cultures, beliefs, and he's actually a generally good person. Although I've never had the privilege of meeting him with him. But it is interesting to see there's nothing Hollywood hates more than religion, which is ridiculous. But they have their own religion, which is the worship of themselves. Now, going over to the Trump and the politic the political part of the podcast, Trump has finally started to launch some of his campaigns. And I was shocked. This, I'll see how good the advertisements and the internet and everything works right now. So this is one of the first campaigns. Now, it's not him. It's his campaign. So let's listen to this really quick. It's morning again in America. And thanks to Joe Biden, our borders are now wide open for all to come. Our school... Now in the video he says, there's a little bit of text and in that they're talking about the fentanyl crisis where the United States, that's one of the biggest, that's a huge issue, which any, if you're smart, if any politician was truly smart, they'd really hone in on that issue because a lot of people are losing their lives because of the massive importation of fentanyl. A lot of it is actually because of the ecosystem, the supply chain, the sales process. A lot of the chemicals are actually made in China. Then they're shipped across the globe and they're imported through Mexico, through that border. It's a, it's a global economy from that, for that disgusting drug that's destroying countless lives. So that's what it's saying on the screen in, in terms of clarification or building upon their stance and their opinion about the border being open. Free from parental involvement. Uh, and then they just, yeah, on the screen there's a drag queen, which, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's a drag queen reading a drag queen book to children that look like they're in first or second grade. And of course, it's drag, so it's overtly sexual, and they're dressed up as you would suspect. Rental involvement. Mediocre male athletes now given the opportunity to compete unfairly. Under Biden's unprecedented inflation, the hope of home ownership gone and young adults. The word inflation is bolded. It's not bold enough. Make that red and triple the size of the font. 40 year high inflation. Just. Again, if Trump or any, just anyone running for office right now, just hammer that point. 40 year high inflation. Like, just hammer that point. Adults forced to abandon seeking the American dream to live in their parents' basement longer. Biden's disaster. Now, that's also due to the private sector, since, well, pseudo private sector, you have businesses which are buying houses and then renting houses. Uh, I hope to host someday. Uh, have the opportunity to own a house and some land. I'm currently renting a house for the podcast as I live in a small room here too. 
but those companies get money from the government, including companies like BlackRock. So it is becoming a harder house because harder to get a house as an individual because the supply is limited in part due to businesses buying a house to rent. Which, if you wind back the clock a couple decades ago, again, I, I wasn't part of the economy in terms of my spending. I wasn't really aware, but you never really heard about that before. So that's a new development. Astra's withdrawal from Afghanistan left billions in weapons. Seven billion dollars. You can't have, you're not allowed to have a semi-auto gun, but the most evil people on the planet, they can have better military hardware than you could possibly fathom for free. Which, again, even if you decide to leave, you know, I don't think it's prudent to tell your enemy when you're leaving and then leaving military gear there. Again, the United States makes the best military gear on the planet. One of the reasons the U.S. is still somewhat of dominant power is because of the private sector behind the research development production of the defense industry. And they just gave so much weight for free. At least destroy it on the way out, but it was utter chaos. I, I've yet to find someone who agrees with that particular political choice. It's behind and American lives taken. Our police ranks now shrinking. Yet Biden spends billions creating an army of 80,000 new IRS agents. Armed IRS agents. Now, the IRS agents in the video are wearing black glasses and very much look like Agent Smith from the Matrix, but they're holding clipboards. Epic fail. Trump, their campaign should have given them a Glock, which is most standard for most departments. I forget the, the IRS standard ha issue handgun is. Many people wonder, why, do you pe why does a clipboard warrior or why does an IRS agent need a handgun when you would think a letter says, should suffice? Hey, you owe us more money. But, yeah, I would have... They missed the mark on that regard. I would have really... Yeah, I would have really driven that point home. Because a lot of people could have started wondering, why are they armed? Why would we ever accept the incompetence and... He's falling up the stairs thrice, or maybe more. Weakness of Biden when we could have the freedom. He fell down. He was standing on a bike, and he fell. Security and economic prosperity we enjoyed just three years ago. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Now, it's important to say Trump did not create this advertisement. It would probably be much different if he did. This was something, it's a very interesting thing in U.S. politics with super PACs and other marketing and advertising vessels for politics. They're not allowed to have direct involvement in terms of they're not supposed to, to my understanding, they can't have the creativity to tell them I think we should tweak X, Y, and Z on this particular advertisement. They can just put their stamp on it and say, yeah, it looks good. So that's rudimentary speaking, that's kind of how super PACs work to my knowledge. So that's why he's saying he approves of this particular message. Now, in terms of political campaigns and political messages, that was very on point. It was very, very little drama, which if Trump wants to win, I think he should emulate the campaign that these folks have made in terms of the messaging. One of the reasons that I and many people believe that he failed last election cycle was just the ADHD, which we all have, but if you stuck to the policies, and that's why a lot of people will wonder my political affiliations and ask me, you know, how did it affect your small business and you know what laws or what helped them out? And I always tell people in terms of fiscal and policy from a business perspective, there were many things that were attractive one of the biggest changes during COVID that Trump did help was the restaurant industry. Now, it's one of those things where taxes and incentives do matter. Prior to the bill that he approved, it was actually a 50% deduction with restaurants. So if I took a prospective client or a current client or a team member to a restaurant for a business meeting, I as a business could deduct 50% of that bill. After legislation was approved, it was now 100% thereby giving me more of an incentive to take more clients to wine and dine. That had a direct response on the economy and the restaurant industry during the time where they were struggling the most. And that's a good example of something that was business, business related that helped a lot of folks. But most people never heard about that. I would advertise the hell out of those specific things that help small businesses, especially. So if he could stay on topic more, I think maybe he will have an actual shot of winning. Time shall tell. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, perhaps 
And this isn't big enough to be the year, but it's big for the company. Now, Peloton just announced that they're going to recall 2 million bikes. And remember, these aren't the cheap $20 bikes you buy at Walmart. These are bikes that are worth like a month's rent or more. We're talking about 1000 I think it's 1000 to $2,000 for a bike that you can't take outside. I know, that's not the point. It has a screen and someone talks to you. But this is, for the, this is not for a product that came out a couple weeks ago. It's for the original bike. So imagine GM recalling every car they've ever made. Bad example, they do. But this is one of those things where it's every car, every bike made since 2018. Now, this, this particular recall is around the PL01 model, sold between January 2018 and May 2023. So yeah, basically everything made since then, since it is May right now. Peloton noted it could be easily identified by the quote red P logo followed by the white colored Peloton brand name on the bike frame and the non swivel display. This is due to a concern of the seat post breaking off. Somewhat ironic if you. Yeah, somewhat ironic. You're trying to lose weight and you break the machine. I don't know the strength, tensile, tensile strength of the actual material that they used, but that's not good. Now, they received 35 reports that this has occurred. And of the 35, 13 included injuries. This isn't good for Peloton, especially when you consider they've had other safety related recalls. The Peloton, I think it's called the Peloton Tread. Their little treadmill that they make that, again, costs more than a car. Well, a beater, but still. That particular treadmill, they had a safety issue where it wouldn't stop if it had a certain sensor or a safety sensor to be utilized. So there's some infants who are actually getting hurt because of that. So they're having multiple safety recalls on a brand that's purportedly supposed to be a lux pseudo, a very big luxury item, they, for all intents and purposes, they invented the category of the subscription exercise gear. And when you look at the price point, all the marketing rudimentary, little supplemental things from the water bottles to all the swag, it's always very much similar to Apple in terms of they always cater it as a premium product using premium materials. And they've also issues, there's a Q2 or Q3 last year where they had the inside of it rust. So again, this is just chipping away at their premium brand. And also they just keep losing. They just have had some real struggles with their sales. How long could they keep going before they have to sell some assets? I believe they still own, they still own the best treadmill on the planet, which is called Precore. That brand is thankfully still, as far as I know, operating independent, but they are owned by Peloton. Will they have to spin them off or sell them? There's a lot of profits. I'm guessing those profits from that brand are supplementing the Peloton one, but time shall tell, but to have a, yet another recall on top of all the ones they've already had, I mean, that's gotta be the business blunder of the day. Thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. All the feedback is greatly appreciated. And every time you share it, that helps the channel grow and develop. More subscribers, more resources that we have, the better of the content we'll be able to create. Also, don't forget to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe and fight the good fight.